Welcome to Full Gospel Fellowship. If you like what you see here, hit that thumbs up and remember to subscribe to our channel. Thank you and God bless. All right, we're going to be in John chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 26 through 41 as we conclude this message of the man who was born blind. John chapter 9, verses 26 through 41. Starting in verse 26, it says, Then said they to him again, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him, and they said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. And the man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. And since the world began, was it not heard that any man had opened the eyes of one that was born blind. And if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. And Jesus heard that they cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. In the beginning of in the beginning of John chapter nine, Jesus passed by. He saw a man who had been blind since birth. It was not an accident that Jesus was passing by at that very moment, nor was it by chance that Jesus saw this man who had been blind since birth. But this was all by divine appointment from God. All of what was about to happen in this man's life was all according to God's will, to God's plan and purpose for him and for those who would be witnesses to what Jesus was about to do. You are not an accident. You were not born by, by mistake. God made you. God created you to live for him. You were born to serve the Lord. You were born to bring glory and honor to God. And your purpose in this life is to influence somebody else for Jesus. So that means that you've got a calling and you've got a purpose in this life. And it's all about glorifying Jesus Himself. Nothing is by mistake. Nothing just happens. God knew who would be here before we ever did. God knew who would show up to church this morning before we ever did. So let, let me remind you and let me remind myself because I need to preach to me sometimes. We do not walk by a sight. We walk by faith in God and if we walk by faith in God don't look at the lack thank God for who's here thank God for what he's doing because God's still in control God can sustain what he will sustain man has no control over that amen if God's in it God will bless it and God will cause it to prosper and God will add and grow when he sees fit so we got a calling and a purpose in this life. And it's all about glorifying Jesus. I'm not called to live for me. I'm not called to make a, everybody in the world happy and neither are you. You're called to make Jesus happy. You're called to please Him. You're called to do what He told you to do. You're called to glorify and honor His name with the way that you live your life. Nothing is by mistake. Nothing that just happens. Everything that happens in this life is all according to God's plan uh, for you as long as you're living your life in the will of God. 
And if you're here this morning, you're here by divine appointment and not just because you decided to show up. Because God wants to touch your life today. God loves you. And you're important to Him. Just as this man here in this story was important to Jesus. The man who was born blind may have been insignificant in the eyes of man. He may, he may have been a nobody in the eyes of the religious church leaders of the time, as we will see later in this story. But he was important, and he was a somebody in the eyes of God, just like you and I are. The disciples wanted to know why this man was blind. So they asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And, and Jesus told them that nobody sinned to bring his blindness on him. But the purpose for this was so that the works of God should be made manifest in him. In other words, this was all about bringing glory to God and pointing others to Jesus. This was about showing this man, as well as all who would see what was about to happen, the miracle working power of God. This was about healing this man from his blindness, and through this healing, salvation would come to him. This was about showing these people, as well as everyone who would read about this event and the Word of God throughout history, throughout the history of the world, what God can do if we will only believe in Him. This man, the man was born blind, not because he or his parents sinned, but so that God would be glorified in his situation. So when we go through something hard in this life, don't let our perspective be to complain or to get bitter and to cry the blues and say, why me? But let our perspective be, how can I glorify God in and through my situation? How can I use this to encourage somebody else? Thank God for that. Thank God for a right perspective. Thank God that He will heal us and deliver us from the selfishness that tries to sit in and say, why me? It's not why me because Jesus could have said, why me? And He never did it, but He did what God called Him to do. It's never why me because this life is not about me. It's all about Jesus. So what can I do for you, God? What can I do to glorify you? What can I do to honor you today? And what can I do to bring somebody else into the kingdom of God? The man was born blind, again, all because, all for the reasons so that God would be glorified in his situation. Jesus spit on the ground and he made some clay. And he touched the eyes of the blind man with the clay and he told him to go wash in the pool. The man did what Jesus said to do. The man was obedient to the word of God. And because he was, he was obedient to do everything, not just some things. Not what He chose to do. Not half of what Jesus told Him to do. But because He completely obeyed the Word that came straight from God Himself in the flesh, the man who once was blind came back seen. You see, the Word of God is plain and simple. If we'll just be obedient, willing, the Bible says we will eat the good of the land. We will have all that God has for us. We will be blessed by God in all that we do. But the flip side of that coin is if we refuse to be willing and obedient, then we will not eat the good of the land. We will not be blessed by God. We will not ultimately prosper in our lives, but we will be cursed because sin is a curse. It's all up to us. And if your sin or addiction is more important to you than God is, if your viewpoint or opinion is more important to you than God is, if you would rather have your way over God's way, God will let you have all that you want as well as the consequences of disobedience that come with that kind of attitude and thinking. The people around town who knew this man and who knew about his condition said, isn't this the man who sat and begged? Others said, no, he just looks like him. But the man himself said, I am he. He was testifying to the people what God had just done for him. And though he wasn't sure who, who Jesus was yet, he was proclaiming to the people about the miracle that just ta had taken place in his life. And I'm sure that he was, had to be overflowing with happiness and joy that, that his life had been completely changed and transformed. And I'm sure he was eager about telling anybody and everybody about what had just happened to him. And the people wanted to know how his eyes were open. And he explained to them what had happened. And they asked him, well, where's the man who did this to him? And he told them he didn't know. And then they brought him to the Pharisees, who were the religious church leaders of the day. Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees then asked the man how he received his sight. 
He told him the same story that he had been telling everybody else. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man who's a sinner, how can a man that's not of God do such miracles? And the people were divided in what to think about who Jesus was and about what He did uh, in restoring the sight to the blind man. And the fact of the matter is the Pharisees who, who said that Jesus was not of God, those people held their own church rules and regulations. They held their own traditions and their personal preferences and their own opinions and viewpoints. And they held their, their church denomination above God Himself and above what His Word had to say. They didn't care about this miracle. They didn't care about what Jesus did. They overlooked the blind man receiving his sight because it wasn't done their way. It wasn't done according to how their church said to do things. It wasn't done according to their way of thinking. Therefore, what did they do? They rejected Jesus. They rejected the Word of God. They rejected this miracle because what did they do? They chose to strain at a gnat and they swallowed a camel instead. They focused on the insignificant and missed the big picture. For example, never mind that the man or the woman who came to church today got saved and got delivered from their sins and addictions and had their life touched by the power of God. Never mind that, because you'll always have those modern day Pharisees who would say, I can't believe they dress like that. I can't believe they've got that many tattoos on their body. I can't believe they acted like that. I can't believe that they come from where they came from. I can't believe that they look that way. You'll always have the modern day Pharisees who will strain at a gnat and swallow a camel and overlook the miracle working power of God and what God had just done in somebody's life. They won't look on the heart. They'll just look on the outside. And Jesus was plain when He told them, don't look on the outside. Anybody can clean up. Anybody can dress like a preacher. Anybody can, can spiff up and spit, uh, polish themselves and make them look like what they want to look like. But it's the heart. It's what's inside that counts. And I can guarantee you, and you can show me something different if you want to, all God requires from you is your heart, and He will do the rest. All God looks at is your heart. People strain it in that, and they swallow a camel. They ignore what God's done in somebody's life because they can't get out of their preconceived notions of what a person or what a Christian is supposed to look like, supposed to be like, and everything else. All, all, all you got to do to be a Christian is give your heart and life to Jesus, accept Him into your uh, heart and life, live for Him according to His Word, and God will tell you what He wants you to do. Let our perspective always be about God and His Word and never about what we think in our flesh. These religious leaders asked the man who had been born blind, what he thought about this man who opened his eyes. And he said, he is a prophet. He knew that Jesus had to be of God in order to do what he did to him. He already knew more than these Pharisees uh, knew who claimed to know everything. But in reality, they knew absolutely nothing because they didn't even know that God in the flesh was walking among them. These Jews didn't believe that this man was ever blind. So, so now they attempted to, to discredit this miracle as well as Jesus and this man. So they called his parents who confirmed that their son was born blind. But, the, but then those parents quickly followed that up by saying that they had no idea by what means he now sees, nor did they have any idea about the man who performed this miracle. And then they told the Pharisees to ask their son themselves. They distanced themselves from this uh, situation quickly. Why? They feared the Jews. They feared what the religious church world thought. They feared what other people thought. They feared what the world thought. They feared being excommunicated from the church, which would affect their social standing in the community. All, after all, they might lose some friends over this. Because you see, the Jews had agreed that if anybody confessed that Jesus was the Christ, then they would be put out of the church. And how many people filled churches today where everybody but Jesus Himself is invited to attend. How many people fill churches today who they claim Christ? They like the idea of Jesus. They'll use the name of Jesus, but they have no intentions of, of inviting Him to attend their services 
because their way of having church is more important to them than God's way of having church. Their message has replaced God's message. If you're not preaching and teaching the very Word of God, if you don't love people enough to tell them the truth according to His Word, if you didn't come to church this morning to allow Jesus to have His way completely, if what your church te teaches and what your pastor preaches is more important than what the Word of God says, if your church and what you do isn't all about Jesus, then Jesus is not there because He's not been invited in. If you read the Bible, Jesus did not hang out with the religious church leaders who claim to know everything. He, didn't, he hung out with the sinners. Jesus hung out with the prostitutes. Jesus hung out with a woman caught in the act of adultery. Jesus hung out with a woman at the well who'd been married five times and whose life was a wreck. Jesus hung out with people who needed a physician and who needed a Savior. And what did He do? He forgave their sins. He changed their lives. And they became loyal followers of Him. Because the fact of the matter is that the message of love, forgiveness, mercy, and compassion, and the message of grace, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it resonated with those people. It didn't resonate with those who were bound by their religious spirits and attitudes. And thank God for the truth. Thank God for the message that resonates with those who really want to hear it. The message of the gospel didn't resonate with those uh, wh whose church rules and, re and regulations and traditions and their personal preferences and opinions. It didn't resonate with any of those people who had all of the, who held all of those things in higher esteem than God Himself. But the message of the gospel did resonate with people like the man in this story who was born blind, but then had a tremendous miracle take place in his life. The message of the gospel obviously resonated with all of us who are truly saved here this morning. Pharisees called the man again. They said, give God the praise. They thought they were serving God. They weren't serving anybody but the devil. Give God the praise because we know this man is a sinner. In their eyes, he had to be a sinner. He couldn't have been of God because he didn't line up with their denomination. He didn't do things the way nor on the day. They thought it should have been done. Therefore, he couldn't have been of God. They were trying to sway this man to say what they wanted him to say. They wanted him to proclaim what they wanted to hear rather than the truth. They were trying to get him to stop preaching what they didn't want to hear. They wanted that satisfying the itchy ears, easy on the flesh, anything goes kind of gospel. But the man would not be swayed. Just like we as true people of God should never ever be moved no matter how much the devil and this world tries to huff and puff and tell us what we ought to accept and not accept as being okay and what to preach about and not to preach about. This man would not be moved nor influenced by the religious church crowd so he said to them in response, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is I used to be blind but now I can see. He didn't know anything about what these people were saying to him. All he knew was that, 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 that this man called Jesus. All he knew was what this man called Jesus had just done for him and had just done in his life. You see, he focused on the evidence rather than what the Pharisees were saying. And the evidence said that God just changed his life forever. And that was all that mattered. Going on to verses 26 through 41. They asked him again what happened. How did this man open his eyes as if his answer was going to change? They were trying to trip him up. They were trying to cast any doubt they could on what happened to him. And the, ran, the man responded by saying, I already basically, I already told you what happened and you didn't hear. You didn't listen. So why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be one of his disciples? These Pharisees heard the words that the man was telling them but they refused to accept the message that was coming out of his mouth. They refused to believe the truth that the man was speaking. You see, they didn't have a hearing problem. They had a heart problem in that they rejected Jesus and rejected the miracle that he performed on this man, which proved who Jesus really was, which was a fact that they did not want to accept or believe. You see, many people read the Word of God. Many people go to church all the time. They know what's written in the Word of God. They hear what's preached in the church. They know what's right and wrong according to God's Word. But many people don't want to believe the truth that's in the Word. 
They don't want to accept everything that it says. They don't want to believe that what is written will never change no matter what society says. Therefore, many people reject it because what society says is more important to them than God's Word. Fitting in with the world is more important with, with probably over half of the church world today and half of the preachers who claim to be called of God. I expect the world to think like that. But many professing Christians are leaning towards apostasy. And that's why many people choose churches that preach what they choose to believe rather than what God's Word actually says. Many people are, and the Word says it's going to happen. So we really shouldn't be surprised by it. The Word of God is just being fulfilled right before our eyes. Well, why is it there are more people? Just read the Word of God. In the last days, they will heap unto themselves itching ears who basically tell them what they want to hear. And that's why they leave true churches and go find them somebody else who tell them that everything's going to be alright no matter what. Rather than the Gospel being about Jesus, the Gospel's become about them. Many people leave true, just like I said, many people leave true churches by the droves because they'd rather listen to a 20-minute motivational speech which tells them that no matter what they do, no matter how they live, everything's going to be all right. They'd rather go to churches that have hiking trips, campouts, and so-called Christian rock concerts every other week so they can be entertained rather than going somewhere that'll tell them the truth, which is the only thing that will ever set them free. Many people are going by the way of, of apostasy. What's that? Just simply choosing to believe and accepting things that are in direct opposition to what God's Word says. You see, I don't care what our nation calls legal. If what's legal goes against what God's Word says, then we as God's people better take a stand against it. And we better proclaim what the Bible says because we don't ever want to be on the wrong side of what God calls illegal according to His moral law. I don't want to be one of those standing before God. Well, brother, I don't like to say, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say anything about, about these popular lifestyles today, so I'll just be quiet. It's the same as agreeing with it if you refuse to stand on the truth. You may never say a word either way, but if you don't speak out against it when God gives you the opportunity, if you don't tell people what's right and wrong, if you don't tell people what sin is and isn't, God will require their blood at your hands because. Not saying anything is the same as agreeing with it. We are not called to sit down and shut up. We are called to proclaim this message regardless of who's in front of you, whether they like it or not, because you ought to love people enough to tell them the truth. Who cares if they get offended? The lake of fire is far worse than their offended feelings. Maybe with a hint of sarcasm, the man said to the Pharisees, why are you asking me so many times about what happened? I already told you. How many times must I repeat myself? Do you want to be His disciples too? And this man was emboldened by what Jesus did in his life. And the truth did what the truth always does. It had an effect on the people who heard it. And in this case, it stirred the people up. The truth according to the Word of God will either attract those who want to hear it, or it will clear the room of those who reject it. But regardless of the effect, the truth must be preached and taught either way. The truth must be preached no matter what, and if we can't preach the truth here, then you might as well lock the doors and go do something else. We're not called to fill pews. We're called to proclaim the gospel. We're all called to go out in the highways, not just the preacher. Everybody is called to go out in the highways and into the hedges and to compel people to come in and let God do the rest. And the man said, will you also be his disciples? They reviled him. Then they vilified him. They became verbally abusive towards him. What was really in their heart came out. And it wasn't anything to do with God. Because you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's really in the heart is who we really are. What we produce and what we do in our life shows who and what we're about. These religious church leaders, they reviled this man who simply spoke the truth and they got on their superior high horse and they said to him, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. And see, we know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he came from. You see, had they really known Moses as they claimed, had they really known the Word of God as they claimed, they would have known who Jesus was. 
And the man that was born blind said, Why herein is a marvelous thing? This is absolutely astonishing that you don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eye. He's basically telling these folks that they should know that Jesus came from God because of what he just did. Shouldn't even be a question. There should be no debate, just as there should be no debate about the Word of God. It is the inerrant, it is the infallible Word of God, and it changes not. And if your life is not lined up with the Word, your life is not right with God. Young people, I don't care what that, the schools tell you, I don't care what society tells you, I don't care what the world tells you, if it's not lined up with the Word of God, it is wrong. We love people, we pray for people, but we cannot shake hands with their sin and say what you do is okay when it goes against the Word of God. You understand what I'm saying? That goes for all of us. He's basically telling this people again, it should not even be a question. The Word of God is the inerrant, infallible Word that comes from the throne of God, and it will not change. Then the man begins to preach, and he said, we know that God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone be a worshiper of God and does His will, then God will hear him. And what the man is saying is that God wouldn't perform this miracle through someone who wasn't of God. He's not saying that God won't hear or answer a prayer of a sinner. Because God heard our prayers when we repented. And God has undoubtedly answered the prayers of many people who were lost in their sins and who cried out to Him for help in order to reveal Himself to them. But this man says that God wouldn't perform this miracle through a man who wasn't of God, but He would through someone who worships God and who is obedient to Him. And then he goes on to say, since the beginning of time, We've never heard of anyone who's opened the eyes of one who was born blind. So the fact of the matter is, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing at all. In simplicity, in simple terms, the man is revealing the truth to these people by telling them that the proof is in the pudding. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And at this point, these people had a choice, as we all do. They could accept what the man said. They could have their spiritual blindness removed. And they could become true followers of Jesus. Or they could continue on in their sins and in their religious attitudes and continue to reject Christ. And their next statement shows what choice they made. They said to the man in their arrogance, You were all together and entirely born in sins. And do you dare? Do you presume to teach us who do you think you are? They're know-it-all. You can't tell me anything. I've been in church for years. I'm better than you and no more than you. Your sins are worse than mine attitude. It rejected God's truth which was spoken by the man who was born blind and then they just did the man a favor and cast him out. They excommunicated him from their false church. They could not truthfully argue with what he said so they responded with hate, with anger and insults which is what a lot of people do when they can't win a, a debate. And they threw him out of the church. Unlike his parents, this man couldn't care less. He stood on what he believed and knew to be true. Jesus heard that they threw him out of the church. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe on the Son of God, which is the essence of the gospel? Because you see, in order to be saved, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. We must believe that Jesus is who the Bible says He is. And the man said, Who is He, Lord, that I might believe on Him? He calls Jesus Lord as if He already knows in His heart who He really is. And Jesus said, You have both seen Him, and it is He who talks with you. In other words, I am He. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and then he worshipped Jesus. He's now saved which is what the miracle that Jesus did in his life brought him to. It worked to the salvation of his soul, which was its, in, its intent and purpose for his life. To truly believe in Jesus leads us to receiving him into our heart and life, which then leads us to living for him, which is what salvation is all about. And Jesus then says, For judgment I'm come into the world, that they which see not might see, which pertains to spiritual blindness, which is the condition of anyone who is without Jesus, and that they which see might be made blind, which speaks to those who think they see, 
but in reality they don't. As well as to those who claim to know the truth, but in reality they know nothing, which was the case of these Pharisees who rejected Christ. Jesus has come into the world to separate those who believe in Him from those who reject Him and to declare judgment on those who choose to be separated from God. Jesus has come to save those who want to be saved and who want their spiritual blindness removed. And some of the Pharisees who were there heard what Jesus said. They were offended, which is what the truth is designed to do. The truth is designed to offend our sin. The truth is designed to offend our stinking thinking. The truth is designed to offend our flesh. The truth is designed to offend our religious attitudes, to offend this world, and to offend the devil himself. The truth is designed to offend anything that's not of God. Why? So that the offended will repent and get right with God. And the Pharisees asked Jesus, are we blind also? They weren't asking because they wanted to know. They were asking with sarcasm because they already presumed to know everything which made them unteachable and, uncha and unchangeable and which then made them of no use to God. That may sound harsh, but when a person gets to that point of refusing to be changed, of refusing to listen and to be taught anything, when a person thinks that they know all there is to know, then God cannot use them because He cannot give them any more than they already have because they will not allow it, as was the case with the Pharisees. Are we blind also? They asked Jesus. And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. If they were truly ignorant of spiritual things, then they wouldn't be responsible for what they really didn't know. But since they claim to have, uh, have the knowledge of God, since the truth has been preached to them through the man who was born blind, since they claim to know the Word, since they know that a miracle was done in this man's life which could only be done uh, by a man who was from God, since God in the flesh was standing before them and speaking to them, then they are stuck in their sins due to their willful rejection of Jesus. If people come to this church on a regular basis, they can never go to God and say, I didn't know the truth. If you don't have a Bible, we can give you a Bible. You can never go to God and say, I didn't have the Word. If you really want it, God will give it to you. If you really want to know the truth, God will give it to you. But if you want to go with the way of the world, and you want to shake hands with those who are lost in sin, and you want to go with what society says is okay when it's not. Let me tell you something. This nation is Sodom and Gomorrah today. And we can't reverse that. Amen? The Bible says that things will wax worse and worse. And things are in the immorality in this country and all over the world is waxing worse and worse. And when you turn on the news and you see those two earthquakes back to back in California, things are waxing worse and worse. When you see all kinds of weather happening that we hadn't seen before in a long time, things popping up just anywhere. When you see the hate that's in this world getting worse and worse, there's your evidence that, th that things are not going to get better. Things are only going to get worse because the Bible declares that if Jesus hadn't cut short the days, that no flesh would be saved. That's the road that we're on today. And let me tell you something, don't despair in that, because God's people are going to be taken care of. Quit looking at how we're going to reverse it. God's truth has already been spoken. We're already on track. But we got to use our time not to worry about dumb things that don't matter. we got to use our time to preach to people whether they hate us or not or whether they love us for it or not. we got to tell them we love them. But you got to come out of your sins. you got to lay the bottle down. you got to lay the drugs down. you got to lay, lay the lust and the pornography down. you got to lay the homosexuality down. Forget the transgenderism. It's confusion that the devil has put on you. And you're going to go to hell unless you repent. And it's not to say that we, that's not hate speech, that's truth speech because we love people enough to tell them where they're at. And I can speak from my own experiences. I thank God for a church that didn't mince words and they told people the truth not because they hated them, because they loved them, because they wanted them to be all they could be in God. They wanted them to be saved. They wanted them to be delivered from their sins just like they got delivered. Because we've been on both tracks, sides of the track. I know what a life of living like a, like the devil will do, just like you do. And I know today what a life of living for God will do. And it is...
He demands a separation from this world. A separation from sin. You can't have it both ways. It's either God or it's the devil. It can't be both. You can love them. You, you, can, you can talk about football with them. You can be friends with them, uh, so to speak. And have dinner with them if you want to. But you can't shake hands with the devil and you can't tell people they're okay when you know they're in sin. Use those opportunities to preach the truth to them in love. Tell them that there's, there's a God who loves them enough that will forgive them and that will wash them clean and that will deliver them from where they're at, regardless of where they're at. I know what addiction is. And God delivered me. It took a while, but He delivered me. And I can tell you God will deliver you. I know what evil lifestyles are. And I can tell you by experience and through the Word of God, if you really want deliverance, God will deliver you. But you can't expect God to conform to you. You've got to conform to Him. If you need prayer before we take communion, I want you to come up here. God loves you. We love you. God wants you to be all that you can be in Him, and we do too. Let me tell you something. We love everybody, but man, we've got to know the truth so that the truth can set us free. If you need prayer, you come up. Let's pray for you.